Sir John Tavener was 69 when he died last year. He'd struggled all his life with health problems. A stroke at the age of 35 changed totally his perspective on the world and strengthened his faith, firmly rooted in the Greek Orthodox Church. He started his musical career as an avant-garde radical in the 1960s and was signed to the Beatles' Apple record label. And then he found a higher calling, writing almost exclusively sacred works. He was a complex character whose music has the power to speak to everyone, as we found out when we went to the home of tonight's conductor, Peter Phillips, who was a great friend of Sir John Tavener. He was the sort of man who, because of his height, really, and his very strange um, colour, he, um, he liked to lie in the sun or a substitute for the sun. And he'd got a sort of orange colour and he'd, <laughs> he'd got this fantastic hair and cross, big cross here on his chest. And he was a very um, impressive man. I liked him a lot, right from the start. I always found John to be quite uh, humble in the sense that he would, he would always take suggestion and be interested in, in what I would have to say or anyone would have to say. He's been reported as being quite an arrogant man, but I, I never really saw that. I mean, when he was driving his Rolls Royce at 150 miles an hour down the motorway, I suppose that's a kind of arrogance to have one at all. But uh, I, I always, I mean, I never was put off by this. I found it very attractive. In the end, John wrote very intuitively, very instinctively, right there. He was capable of this very direct means of expression. He wrote for us some quite complicated, mathematically complicated pieces. But even those, I think, don't put people off. I think there's a style there which draws you in. And it's to do with this f instinctive feeling he's got for the atmosphere of, of a church service. And I used to go to those services with him, which lasted all night, if necessary. But you get caught up in it. It's a kind of almost druggy situation. You know, you just can't, you don't want it to stop. And he was, he was very much caught up in it like that. And when he came to write music, out it came. I went to stay with John one night about two years ago now, because um, I was passing by, and he asked me to take with me a score of a very complicated canon mathematical construct by Josquin Desprez, a leading Renaissance composer. He'd got the recording and he could, hear, he could hear how complicated it was, but he wanted to see it on paper. So I took this with me and we listened to it. He had this compulsive way of listening. He just went round and round and round. We spent all day just listening to this canon. Um, I noticed that by him on the sofa was a manuscript that he was writing out in pencil. He found it very hard work. He was in great pain, actually, at this point to write. But he was working on it. And he said, I'm writing a requiem. He didn't say it was for us at that point. And I don't think he'd written the last movement of it, which has a very complicated canon in it. Uh, some weeks later, it was made clear that this was for us and that it, it for me and for the Talis scholars. And very interestingly, 30 years later, it seems to be related to the Icon of Light and I don't know whether he was doing this on purpose or not. He never said. I do have a, a, a strong sense of responsibility in, in giving this first performance of what I think is a great work by a composer who happened to be a friend of mine. And I, will, I know that I'm going to be trying to find him again in the notes. I, I'm sure I will, but um, it's such an overwhelming moment to perform a big piece like this in the Albert Hall. We'll see.
The world premiere of one of Sir John Taverner's final works, his Requiem Fragments, performed by the Talis Scholars with the Heath Quartet, soloist Carolyn Sampson, the trombone players Roger Harvey and Barry Clements, and conducted by Sir John's great friend Peter Phillips. When I look at a, an icon of the Mother of God, let's say, or an icon of Christ, it moves me to bend my whole body in prostration before it. I love the icon of the tenderly kissing virgin. She's pointing, and she always has to point to her son, but the child is not a sort of plump Renaissance baby. The child is uh, stylized. There's a look of wisdom in his face, which you wouldn't see on a straightforward painting of an infant. I think I want to try and make a music, if it's possible, uh, that is a kind of sounding icon.